By the way, anybody who is uh, looking at the recordings, I'm way behind in posting recordings, so I apologize for that. I'll get there eventually. All right, we are in Matthew chapter 26. <coughs> Beginning around verse 17. <clears throat> So let me just say, uh, as kind of an intro, you know, we are again looking at the the last week in in Christ's life, leading up now to his uh, crucifixion, and uh, you know, this really should be no surprise. Uh, the the whole Bible has is focused on this crucifixion, on this death, on this redemption, <clears throat> all the way. Uh, you, you know that I've talked before it all the way back from Adam and Eve right where we we had uh, that sacrifice was necessary to cover sin then you get the story of Cain and Abel where you know not only uh, is it a sacrifice but it's a blood sacrifice that was important and then in Abraham we have the story of uh, you know the God will provide the sacrifice then you have the stories of the Passover that talk about the sacrifice has got to be a spotless unblemished lamb and as, as we get here into the Gospels, as, as I've said before, we've, we've got a huge portion of the Gospel which is really dedicated to this story of, of the sacrifice. Uh, and in all the Gospels, just 20 to 25 percent of the Gospels are really about this final week and the sacrifice. And of course, the whole rest of the New Testament is all about the impact of that cross on the community. So we've got <clears throat> we are we are in the midst of the peak of uh, of the lesson of the gospel of what this is all about and so uh, let's take it all in <clears throat> so last week you if you remember or last time that we spoke i guess i should <coughs> say thanks to rick for subbing last week really appreciate you doing that rick that uh it really means a lot when when you guys will will uh will do that and and, and provide something for the class so so i really appreciate it um <clears throat> so last week or the last time uh in the uh, beginning of chapter 26 we kind of saw the you know god's preparation that uh, you know he's saying two days uh it's going it's going to happen right two days uh is the passover that's uh, that's the final timeline then we saw the preparation by the religious leaders uh you know getting their scheme together we saw the preparation by mary of anointing jesus before his death and then, of course, we saw the preparation of Judas, uh, who was uh, trying to get 30 pieces of silver. So now what we see as we get into uh, verses 13 and following is, is Christ's preparation himself. What is he doing to prepare for his death? And we picked up that story then in verse 17. So let me read 17, and then uh, we'll have a few things to say, obviously. Verse 17 says, Now on the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? So we have here the story of the final Passover and then the Lord's Supper um, at, the, at the end of it. <clears throat> Jesus was very committed to having this last supper with the disciples. It was very important to him. And we'll talk a lot more about that as we get into it. Uh, the, there are parallel passages to this passage in all the Gospels in Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, in Luke, it actually has the statement, and in fact, if you want the reference, it's Luke twenty two fifteen. it says, And he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. It's a kind of a strange phrase, right? With desire, I have desired. I mean, he really desired to eat this Passover with them. It was very important to him. And we'll get into why as we get into it. <clears throat> so he says, On the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, so just as a reminder, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread was a seven-day festival that they held. Um, it was all about remembering the unleavened bread, right? When they left Egypt, uh, they were told to leave all of the leavened bread behind uh, and only bring unleavened bread because they didn't want to bring anything that was an influence from Egypt. Anything, you know, and, and we talked about leaven before. The picture of leaven is really a picture of influence. And they said, leave all that leaven behind. Oh, leave all the thinking of Egypt. Leave all the uh, the idols of Egypt behind as we go uh, you know, into the promised land. So this festival of unleavened bread is to remind them of that, is to remind them uh, uh, of what they left behind intentionally 
uh, in, in Egypt when they came out. Um, if you turn for a minute, well, well, I can just read it. I, I'm, I'm, I keep debating in my head whether I want you to turn or whether I want you to uh, just listen. So just listen to this one. There's a couple I'm going to want you to actually turn to. But in Mark's version, in Mark 14, 12, it says this. It says, and the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said to him, where wilt thou that we go and prepare and mayest eat the Passover? The first part of that is what I want you to see here. It says the first day of unleavened bread when they killed the Passover. There's a connection between the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover. The Passover is a single day, and it is one day at the beginning of the Festival of Unleavened Bread. Now, often in Scripture, when they talk about the Passover, they're actually talking about the whole festival. The, 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 the Actually, when they killed the Passover lamb and the Festival of the Unleavened Bread, and sometimes when they talk about the festival of the unleavened bread, they're also including the Passover. And so that, that's just something we're going to have to understand as we look into uh, uh, this festival and, and get more information on it. But the thing I want you to get here is the Passover was the first day, uh, it, which was followed by this festival of unleavened bread that, that, that followed it. The Passover obviously is the, you know, remembering uh, when God uh, delivered Egypt from Egypt, uh, from Egypt uh, when the angel of death came, right? You remember they put the blood over the doorposts such that the angel of death would pass over them uh, and kill only the Egyptian firstborn uh, as part of the plagues that um, uh, that came upon the Egyptians as, uh, as Moses was trying to drag them out. So the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, a very another very important thing is that the Passover occurs on a particular day of the year, right? It, it's uh, the fourteenth day of the month of Nisan, right? Just like Christmas for us occurs on the twenty fifth day in December, it's not on a particular day of the week, okay? Like Thanksgiving is on a particular day of the week, right? But Christmas is a particular date. The same thing with Passover; it doesn't occur on a particular day of the week. It occurs on a date. Now, in this particular year, when this occurred, that day, the day of the week is Thursday. OK, if you remember, we've spent the last couple of chapters in Wednesday. So now when we get to uh, verse 17, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread or the Passover, uh, this is now Thursday. We finally got into Thursday. We spent a lot of time on uh, on uh, on Wednesday. So the other thing to remember about the Passover is <clears throat> during the Passover, uh, they would kill, they would sacrifice a lamb, right? Uh, the lamb was typically selected uh, three to four days ahead of time. Uh, so if this is Thursday, the lamb would be selected on Monday. That lamb would actually be invited into the house of the family so that they would develop a, uh, a, a friendship or a relationship with the lamb. I know this is sound a little bizarre before they killed him, right? They wanted they wanted it to be not just uh, uh, it, it, uh, God really set this up such that there was a that there was a they had some feelings towards this lamb uh, before they killed the lamb, uh, which would occur on the Passover. The Passover was all about that day when that happened, right? So What's interesting is when they selected the lamb, that would be on Monday. And as you remember from our study, uh, the you know when Jesus actually entered Jerusalem was on Monday, and that's when they actually selected the lamb. Just the connections between these things are very intriguing. All right, so the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and said, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? The one thing you got to understand also about the Passover is the Passover had to be eaten in Jerusalem. Right. So they would typically spend the nights in Bethany, as we've talked about before. But in order for them to do the Passover, they had to find a place inside of Jerusalem in order to do that. So now let's look at verse 18. <clears throat> and he said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So again, the Passover has to be eaten in the city. So Jesus is sending his disciples into the city in order to uh, in order to find this place where they can have the Passover. Um, 
I do want you to turn to Mark chapter 14 a minute and see the next passage. So Mark chapter 14, verse 13. So Mark 14 is the parallel passage. Because here in Matthew it says, go into the city and there'll be a certain man. Well, that's a little bit nebulous as to who is this man and how do we find him? How do we know that this is the man? So in Mark chapter 14, verse 13, <clears throat> Mark 14, 13, it says, he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, teacher, where's the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared and there make ready for us. All right, so he tells these two disciples, I want you to go into the city. I want you to meet a certain man. And by the way, that man will be carrying a pitcher of water. Well, you might say, well, that's not very much more information, right? Go find a man and find a man that's carrying a pitcher of water. But it, would it be unusual for him to find a man carrying a pitcher of water? Yes, that's the women that did it. Yeah, that's that's a woman's job, right? And so that would be that would be actually very unusual for a man to be carrying a pitcher of water. Um, and so he sends he sends these two disciples in. He says, "Look for a man carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him, and he will lead you to this room and say these things to him." Right? Say the teacher says. Now, <clears throat> uh, back in Matthew. <clears throat> right, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So obviously this person that they went to meet uh, had to have been a believer for him to have responded to this statement, right? That the teacher says, or the master says, some of your translations might say, right? He obviously knew who, who that was and who that meant. And it's very possible that, that Jesus had prearranged with this man uh, this uh, this room and and uh, you know that that his disciples would be coming. We don't know any of that, um, but but he certainly it's certainly pretty clear that the man you know was a disciple of Jesus. And then he he says to him, "My time is at hand, right? My appointed time, my my time specified by God, right? This is this is the my my time, and I will keep the Passover at your house." By the way, he didn't ask him. <laughs> He let him know, right, that he's going to keep the he's going to keep the Passover at his at his house. And as we read in Mark, right, he says that he had a spa spacious room for them to use. Now, you might say, well, that that obviously he has prearranged uh, for him to have this room already for them. But one thing you need to know is that <clears throat> again, during the Passover, a million Jews uh, come into uh, Jerusalem in order to have the Passover. So uh, it was expected uh, if you lived in Jerusalem that you were going to be hosting uh, people for the Passover. Uh, and, and this was this was a, uh, a blessing for them to be able to host people for the Passover. So everyone that lived there uh, had a space where they uh, would invite people to come for the Passover. So it's not as unusual as you might think that he had this room already and prepared. Everybody in Jerusalem had a room ready and prepared. What's interesting in this story is he's telling the disciples, and by the way, in, um, in Luke it says that the disciples were uh, Peter and John, but um, he, he, tells the, he tells the disciples, I want you to go, I want you to find a certain man, he's carrying a jug of water. Why didn't Jesus just tell him, go find Fred, right <laughs> who's in jerusalem why why all the secrecy do you think why all the clandestine in the in the information that he gives them any thoughts on that pharisees and the sadducees were out to find jesus so they had to operate under the radar and all the timing was right yes yes and there just happens to be uh, someone in their midst who is looking for an opportune time, right? Judas, we've already found out, is already looking for an opportune time when they're alone, when he can signal to the religious leaders, now's the time, go get him, right? So I think this is primarily to keep Judas in the dark as to where they're going. He tells, he tells uh, uh, Peter and John to go and to... Um, 
And to find this place, there's a certain man, and blah, blah, blah. But he doesn't give any more information of that. I believe he doesn't want Judas to know exactly where he's going to be. That It's not quite time yet. It's going to be time very soon, but it's not quite time yet. And uh, so he uh, he gives them this kind of secret information, if you will. All right, so let's go on to the story. Verse 19. <clears throat> so the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. So, you know, Jesus directed them. He commanded them, if you will. And the, the disciples are obedient. Again, uh, in particular, this is Peter and John. They go to prepare the Passover. The Passover... <laughs> Uh, as as you know, and as we'll talk more about, there's very detailed. There's a lot of stuff that has to be done, including the killing of the uh, of the lamb, right? So um, another rule uh, at the time was you could only have two people uh, bring the lamb to the temple to be sacrificed. So uh, Jesus here selects Peter and John to take the lamb to be sacrificed, um, and then uh, to prepare the whole rest of the meal, get all the other parts and pieces together. So they took, uh, you know, they they assembled, uh, Peter and John assembled all the necessary information at this certain man's house. And frankly, we don't even know who that was. We never do. Um, and uh, and prepare the Passover. Now, now I need to throw a little monkey wrench into the conversation here. <laughs> I'm unusual. <laughs> cool. So at, at this point, I think I have convinced you uh, that we are about to have the Passover meal, that Jesus is going to partake of the Passover meal here on Thursday night, and uh, they're, they're getting ready, and then he's going to come and, and have the Passover meal, right? Everybody agree we're about to partake of the Passover meal? Yes. Yes. Never. Maybe. Great. <laughs> now I need, you to, I need you to turn to John, the Gospel of John, because there's a little... Funny thing we have to deal with here. In John chapter 18. <clears throat> and it's it's one of those funny things that when we're done, you go, oh, that's pretty cool. So John chapter 18. <clears throat> we want to look at verse. Well, we're going to end up looking at verse 28. But, you know, John 18, here we have uh, in this uh, in, in the beginning of the chapter, we've got the betrayal of Jesus, right? His arrest. <laughs> In Gethsemane, so this is later on after the after they've had the Passover meal, he gets arrested in Gethsemane. He brought before the high priest. Um, you know, he he gets questioned by the high priest, and eventually, when we get down to verse twenty-eight, he's being brought into Pilate's court. So let me just read for you verse twenty-eight. It says then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was early morning, but they themselves did not go into the Praetorium lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. So here we have the Jews, led by Caiaphas, who are bringing Jesus to Pilate in the Praetorium, which is uh, a Gentile building of the Romans, right? It, early in the morning. This would be Friday morning. And it says, and they, and they themselves did not go into the Praetorium, lest they should be defiled, because they the Jews would not want to be defiled by going into a Gentile building building it says because they still had to eat the passover they wanted to still eat the passover so they didn't want to go and get defiled on friday morning anybody see a problem so it was they let jesus go in by himself yeah but he by going into the praetorium no, no, no! You're missing my. You're missing the the, uh, the thing that ought to hit you in the head. <coughs> the, the dates Jews, don't add up. The dates. the dates don't add up. The dates don't. Here, the Jews are saying, we can't go into that place because we've still got to eat the Passover. Well, wait a minute! Didn't Jesus and the disciples eat the Passover Thursday night? So how could the Jews be saying, wait a minute, we can't go in there because we still got to eat the Passover? So that's a problem. Now, I want you to stay with me a minute. Go to verse uh, chapter 19 of John, verse 14. <clears throat> Here we have a little bit later, and it says, Now it was the preparation day of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and the Jews said, Behold your king. 
they cried away with him, crucify him, et cetera, et cetera, right? But verse 14, it was the preparation day of the Passover. I need to explain what that means. The preparation day is the day before the Sabbath, okay? So the preparation day is Friday. It's the week of the Passover. It's the preparation day of the Passover. It's not the preparation day for the Passover. It's the preparation day for the Sabbath. It's on the week of the Passover, okay? The language is a little squirrely there, but that's what it means. Now, stay in 19, go down to verse 31. <clears throat> and you'll remember this, right? Therefore, because it was the preparation day or Friday or the day before the Sabbath, the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, on Saturday, for that Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away, et cetera, et cetera. So again, you remember these things, right? So, so it's, it's saying here that Jesus was, was crucified on Friday and they wanted to take him off the cross before the Sabbath on Saturday. Now, which which was it? Did they eat the Passover on Thursday or did they eat the Passover on Friday? That's the question at hand. Because it from what we've just read in Matthew chapter 26, we're going back there now, right? It is very apparent that they ate the Passover on Thursday, but then we have these uh, other passages in John that indicate that the Jews uh, would uh, would not eat the Passover until Friday. So let me tell you the cool reason for all this. Ah. Sorry, something just happened to my notes. Please stand by. Technical difficulties. Technical difficulties on the behalf of a, a dingling operator. All right. So <clears throat> the, the, what's really cool about this is Jesus and his disciples uh, his disciples in particular are from Galilee, right? The Galileans and the Pharisees counted a day from sunrise to sunrise. The, Jew, the Jews in Judea and the Sadducees counted a day from sunset to sunset. So the Galileans would count a day from Thursday morning to Friday morning. They counted the Passover from Thursday morning to Friday morning. The Jews in, in Jerusalem and the Sadducees would count it from Thursday evening to Friday evening. <coughs> so Jesus and his disciples from Galilee had their Passover on Thursday evening, which was the 14th of Nisan, right? It was it was that day. Whereas the Jerusalem Jews ate theirs on <clears throat> Friday evening, which was the 14th of Nisan to them. They ate it on two different days. The, the, the Galilean Jews would have their Passover on Thursday evening. The Jerusalem Jews would have their Passover on Friday evening. So they had daylight savings times too, huh? <laughs> I'm sorry? They do daylight savings. Daylight savings, yeah. What's interesting, too, about this, just in a very practical sense, is, again, you have a million Jews coming into Jerusalem for this Passover. <clears throat> it's kind of nice that they broke it up into two different days. Otherwise, you can imagine the crush at the, uh, at the temple when uh, a million people are bringing their lambs in to get them sacrificed. Can you imagine that? Can you just imagine? So just take half of it, right? A half a million on Thursday, a half a million on Friday, people coming in to get their lambs sacrificed. That had to be some incredible occurrence. <clears throat> As they brought their lamb in, they had to give it up to, to be sacrificed. They had to make sure they got the right lamb back, right? Then they had to take it home and, and prepare the feast and everything else. The other thing that's really I find amazing about all this is that Jesus dies on Friday evening at the same time that a half a million lambs are being killed. The, the noise of a half a million lambs being killed has got to be amazing, right? And, and Jesus is being crucified at the same time. Tom, do you have something to say? Just, I'm just the logistics of how many 
priest would be there to kill the lambs. I mean, that's just a half yeah. million priests. And it may, you know, and just to so you don't go back and tell somebody else the story, it's probably not a half a million because, um, you know, it wouldn't be everybody had their own lamb, right? It, it usually, in fact, in the Old Testament, said you had to have ten people present in order to have the lamb. You know, so maybe it's only a hundred thousand. Um, <laughs> but yeah. still, the logistics of this has got to be absolutely insane. But I just find it interesting the picture in my mind of jesus being crucified on the cross with the sound of you know a couple hundred thousand lambs being killed in the background i just think that's a that's a picture that jesus wanted that's a picture that god wanted right for him to be recognized as the passover lamb uh and and that that all to be taking place at the same time was there a comment there curtis i think yeah no no okay all right let's keep going then verse 20. <clears throat> that's an amazing detail that you pulled out of the scripture i've yeah, never I seen that before me either i hadn't either until i dug into this and it's like wow that's yeah. you know because we always in our heads here's what things that i do in my head in my head i'm thinking yeah jesus died on the passover as the passover lamb well wait a minute they ate the passover in the day before I've never, that glitch never got into my head. That's a problem. And well, it is a problem. And it's solved because of the, the two different dates that these folks had. Yes, he was killed on the Passover. Yes, they had the Passover supper the night before on the Passover date. It's pretty amazing. All right, let's go on to verse 20. <clears throat> so when evening had come, by the way, what evening is this now? Let's see if you all are together. So Thursday. Thursday. This is, this is Thursday. Good. This is Thursday <laughs> evening, right? He sits down with the 12. So now uh, Peter and John have done their job. They have gone and sacrificed the lamb at the temple. They've come back to the house. They've prepared the meal. They pulled together all the little bits and pieces. They come together now for the meal uh, in the early evening. Now, one thing I need to do here is talk a little bit about the sequence of the Passover um, because there are some really cool things that occur here uh, in the timeline. So, um, and, and what I'm going to give you is a very gross representation of the Passover, not all the details, because all the details there are books on. Um, but essentially, the details go like this. First, the first thing they would have is the first cup of blessing. They have a, uh, and, and those of you who take notes, you may want to write down these five or six things because I'm going to refer back to them later. So the first thing was the first cup of blessing. Well, it essentially was a Thanksgiving, right? It's less like our blessing before a meal. They would have that first cup of blessing. The second thing was the ceremonial washing of the hands, which was supposed to represent the cleansing of their sins. The third thing was the bitter herbs and unleavened bread. So they would have this special uh, sauce that they would make up that was made up of grapes and cinnamon and all these things. They had some vinegar poured into it, so it had kind of a bitter taste to it. Uh, so, so again, this was to remind them of the bitter time that they spent in Egypt, et cetera. Then they would have the second cup of uh, uh, wine passed around, the second cup of Thanksgiving for, again, being, uh, being uh, uh, taken out of Egypt. And by the way, when these, uh, these cups in those days, they'd simply pass the cup around the group right and brought it back to the beginning same cup they weren't worried about covid or anything else mm -hmm. um this this would typically be followed by singing uh they would typically um sing the psalms uh in particular it was pointed out like psalm 113 114 115 the psalms in that part of uh, of the psalm they would sing them during that time uh finally the lamb is brought out <clears throat> and uh at that point the uh, bread is broken by the master, whoever the master of the household is, and they would eat the lamb and the unleavened bread together. And then finally, there was the third cup, which was called the cup of redemption, uh, that, that would kind of close out the meal uh, before they would go on to, to some more hymns and singing uh, to, to end the evening. So those pieces are important. Was there a comment there? Well, the cup had been around three times. <laughs> uh, yeah. The cup's been around three times. Yeah, they're feeling pretty good by the end of the night, I think. <clears throat> now, you would, what, what, just to be honest about that, um, 
they would take wine, they would dilute it with water, and they would dilute it with water again for this meal uh, because they didn't want anyone actually to become intoxicated. Uh, it was very intentional that they would have very, very, very uh, diluted wine that they would use uh, to make sure that that was not an issue. So yeah, not a, not a real problem there. So one thing I want to go back to right now is uh, the ceremonial washing of the hands. <clears throat> Now there's some pieces to the story that are not in Matthew, um, and uh, and I and I want to and, and let me just say that the sequence of events of what happened that night um, is a little bit obscure and a little bit different in the different gospels. When did this happen? When did that happen? So I'm going to give you the Rich Hancliff version of when things happened. Okay, which is you know obviously follows some of the commentaries, but. Others have things happening in other places. <clears throat> but just for your reference, uh, the first thing I want to reference is in Luke 22, 24. You don't need to turn there because we have talked about this, uh, this event in several uh, times before. But here we are at the Last Supper, and all of a sudden there, there uh, begins a discussion amongst the disciples about who is the greatest. And you know the disciples have had this discussion over and over and over again. Here again, at the uh, at this final Passover, at the Lord's Supper, they have this question again about who's the greatest. And I, in, in, in some of the commentaries, believe it occurs here because this is when they're coming into the room. They get their first cup of blessing. They're all getting their seats. Some of them are seated next to Jesus. Some of them are seated at the other end of the room. Right, which would, which would then go. Well, wait a minute. Why am I seated way down here? I think I'm pretty important. You could just see the minds of the disciples going back to that silly conversation that they've had over and over again. Jesus then again chastises them uh, for thinking this way and uh, in, in what he has to say in Luke 22. So that that I believe happens here. The other thing I think that happens here is in John 13. Let's go ahead and turn there. Um, to John 13. <clears throat> Again, you'll remember the story, and I'm just trying to put it in place uh, with the evening. <clears throat> and again, actually, John has it occurring at a different place, but it, I believe the most logical place for this to happen is actually right here at the ceremonial washing. So in John 13, we'll begin at verse 3. It says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things to his hands, and he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garment, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured a basin, water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with his towel, which he had girded. Now, the reason that I believe that this occurred here is you remember at, the, at this time when they ate dinner, they actually lounged, right? They, they, they would uh, lay down, essentially eat, uh, sit on their elbows, not sit on their elbows, but lean on their elbows and eat the dinner. So in, in that way, uh, um, my head is next to the next guy's feet, right? Um, and you know, <laughs> uh, and by his stinky feet, <clears throat> by the way, because in those days, uh, <clears throat> there weren't a lot of baths taken, <clears throat> excuse me. But one thing they would do, <clears throat> excuse me, is wash their feet uh, as they come into some, someone's house. And here, <clears throat> what has happened, they've come in, they've taken their places, Jesus recognizes that they have not washed their feet, that no one, you know, a servant hasn't come around and done it. And he steps in and actually does the ceremonial washing of their feet. If you skip down to, uh, if you're still in John, skip down to uh, verse 12. <clears throat> Jesus says, so when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. You say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash another's feet. I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. So I think both of these things occur early in the meal, probably here around the ceremonial washing of the hands, the washing of the feet, this discussion about, about who's the greatest, Jesus kind of putting them in their place and saying, no, you're supposed to be a servant. No, 
uh, you know, it is not about uh, uh, who's the greatest. That's something that the, the Gentiles worry about. <clears throat> All right, so let me just, I'm going to leave that there in your brains. I'm going to come back to that later. Now, <clears throat> let's, <clears throat> oh, man, I'm sorry. I got the crud. <clears throat> let's go back to Matthew. Let's pick up the story. <clears throat> in... Verse 21. So verse 21 says, Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. All right? So um, <clears throat> one of you will betray me. One of you will betray me as they were eating. In the middle of the eating. So I believe this occurs at the bitter herbs. Okay, they're dipping the bread into the sauce, into the special bitter herbs, right? That's what the that's the dipping that you're talking about. So right after the the cleansing, they lay back down. The bitter herbs are served. The sauce that's made up, the unleavened bread is handed out. And I think this is when this uh, these events happen. So again, turn back to Mark. You should have just kept your finger there. I don't know why you didn't keep your finger there. Uh, go back to Mark chapter fourteen. <clears throat> Mark chapter 14, verse, uh, verse 18, Mark 14, 18, says, Now as they sat and ate, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you who eats with me will betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say to him, Is it I, is it I, etc. And we'll get to that in a minute. But here we have, uh, here, here we have him sitting down, and he makes this statement that one of you will betray me. Uh, in John, <clears throat> man, in John chapter 13, verse 21, it, 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 he also adds that he was troubled in spirit, right? I, I think what you have here is Jesus is, is brokenhearted about this. And I, I think you need, to, you need to get that in your brains. This is Jesus seeing someone who has spent the last three years with him, who has seen everything that he has done, and still he recognizes that Judas is going to betray him. I think it breaks his heart to see that, to see someone who has had all this privilege, if you will, of the time with him still makes this really, really, really bad decision. And it breaks his heart. And, he, and, and John, it says he's troubled in spirit. And then here, if you keep reading right in verse 22, I'm in uh, back in Matthew 26, 22, and they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each one of them began to say, Lord, is it I? Right? Lord, is it me? Is it I? In John, it says they, they didn't understand who he spoke about. They didn't know who it was. And they began to ask, ask each other, who do, you, who do you think it is? Who, who is it? What, who do you think? Everyone here is saying, is it me? Is it me? I find this amazing the disciples here think it might be them right peter thinks it might be him timothy thinks it might be him i i find this to be beautiful integrity on the part of the disciples that they would even think it could have been them and i think this is why i think the beating up that Jesus does of them back at the ceremonial washing is paying dividends, right? Uh, he's saying, no, 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 it's, it's about you being a servant. No, 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 you guys are all messed up in your thinking about who's the greatest. And so when he comes here and he says, one of you would deny me, they're already in a state of, whoa, I'm a mess. <laughs> and it might be me. I, I just find this, uh, this honest integrity here by them to be, and I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt, but, but I just, I, I love this in them, uh, th that they think it could be them. And I just think that's a, a just a wonderful response. All right, keep going. <clears throat> we, we beat up the disciples so much, I just wanted to give you a little bit of encouragement that these guys uh, occasionally have it together. And I think this is one time when they did. <clears throat> Verse 23. And he answered and said, he who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. Now, in Matthew's version here, um, that's not saying a lot because, in fact, the bowl is passed around. Every one of them is dipping their hand in this bowl 
Uh, and so all he's saying in that statement is, it's one of you guys, right? One of you is going to betray me. Now, we do need to read the version in John. So turn there, go to John chapter 13, because there's a little bit more detail there that gives us some additional insight. John chapter 13, verse 23. <clears throat> Bless you. <clears throat> John 13, 23, right? So in, in 22, right? Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. And who is that, by the way? John. John, John right? John's <laughs> talking about himself. In verse 24, Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is he whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. And then Jesus said to him, what you do, don't go quickly. Look at verse 28. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. <coughs> so here we have <clears throat> this interesting interaction between John and Peter, right? Uh, saying, hey, you know, I love that Peter saying to John, hey, hey, you ask him, you ask him, right? Um, uh, <laughs> you would think Peter would be the one asking. But anyway, he, Peter, John does ask him, right, you know, who is it? Jesus gives him this sign that says, hey, who I actually give this piece of bread to, that is the one. Um, and he gives him the piece of bread and, uh, and it says then, uh, you know, it was Judas Iscariot, Satan in enters into him. So, in verse 28, when it says, no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him, I think he's saying no one except Peter and John, because I think they now know, right? They have seen, uh, he, he's, he's given this motion about dipping the bread such that, uh, you know, they now understand. But the crowd, uh, the rest of the disciples, as he he's, you know makes the statement, go quickly, they're thinking, they're, uh, well, he's just going to go out and give some money to the poor or do something that, you know, would be his normal job. <clears throat> but uh, I think at this point in time, uh, and, you know, again, half the commentaries agree with me, half of them don't, uh, that uh, Peter and John uh, actually do understand uh, that uh, Judas. And, and the, reason, the reason I believe this is true is because this whole story would not be in there unless someone did actually understand uh, that it was Judas at this time. And I think Peter and John do understand this. And then this story about uh, uh, about the the recognition of the betrayer uh, gets into our gospels. All right. Yeah. On that, Rich, when, when, so were Peter and John the only ones who heard Jesus' response? It says, John leaned back against Jesus and said to him, Lord, who is it? So is, is he kind of like whispering in his ear? And yeah, that's the, that's the understanding here. And that, that a lot of these things that were said were not said uh, loudly to the crowd, and, and in particular, this one was not. He was just kind of indicating back to John only, not to the whole crowd. And you can you can think, right? This is a party going on. Everybody's having their little conversations everywhere. John leans over and whispers this thing to him, uh, you know. And it was just him uh, that indicated that, and, and you know, he let Peter know also because uh, he's the one that asked him the question. So yeah, I agree with that thinking. <clears throat> All right, so then let's go on to verse 24. He now has identified, uh, you know, Judas. Verse 24, the son of man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. <clears throat> so, go, the son of man indeed goes, just as it is written. Now that word go is heavy. It, it means that he goes to his death. It means he goes from this earth. That phrase, um, uh, when it's used in other places in scripture, uh, there's no doubt that he's that talking about uh, leaving the earth, uh, going, uh, you know, going beyond. Um, <clears throat> so he's saying there that uh, the son of man, I actually will go according to the scripture as it's been written about him. Right. Uh, so, again, he's going back to prophecy about his death and in particular. Um, go ahead and flip back to Psalm 41. 
Psalms pretty easy to find. Psalm 41. Oh man, look what time it is. What are you guys doing with the time? Psalm 41, verse 9. Psalm 41, 9. <clears throat> It says here, even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Right. So, so here you have a prophecy about it's going to be a friend who actually lifts up his heel, who betrays him, and someone who eats bread with him. Right. So when Jesus says here, the son indeed will go just as is written of him. <coughs> it's not just all the writing about his death, about his sacrifice, but also about the very specific way uh, that he is betrayed here uh, by by um, <clears throat> by Judas. Now, what's interesting, right? He says, you know, I'm going to go because that's the way it was, uh, you know, th that that it was written about. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed! Damnation to that man. That man would wish that he had never been born <clears throat> because of the penalty. That's come upon him. So we have here, this is all being accomplished according to God's plan. But at the same time, it's Judas who has decided to betray Jesus. It's Judas who has decided not to really be a follower of Jesus. Right? In the same way that mankind is responsible for their choice not to follow Christ, Judas is responsible here for the decisions that he has made. Although it was God's plan, although he had to be betrayed. <clears throat> and this is where a lot of times our brains don't make sense to us, right? We say, wait a minute. <clears throat> if God, you know, did God make Judas betray him and that's not fair? And why would we then throw him into hell? Goodness gracious. <laughs> and this is where our brains don't capture uh, the, the majesty of God, right, who can have a plan and still allow Judas uh, the ability to make this really, really bad decision. <clears throat> and again, if you want to put that on your list of questions to ask God when you get there, because <clears throat> I don't have a better answer for you. All right. Any, any other comments on that? <clears throat> Let's go to verse 25 then. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? So, you know, we saw in the previous, in the previous verse, right, in verse 22, right? Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? And here's Judas now jumping in. Lord, is it I? I don't think he had the same uh, sense of penitence as the rest of the disciples, because he knows it's him. Right? He's already talked to the, the chief priest <coughs> and the scribes. He knows it's him. He's just trying to you know, uh, fool everybody in the place by uh, saying the same thing that the rest of the disciples are saying. <clears throat> and Jesus, of course, you know, knows that and said, you have said it. And that phrase means uh, you have said you are the betrayer. You have said, uh, you know, by your words that you are the betrayer. All right, verse 26. <clears throat> and as they were eating, so so <laughs> they're back to the food now. And And, and by the way, uh, Judas at this time leaves, right, as we read uh, in the other gospel, uh, Satan enters him. Uh, he's dismissed by Jesus at, at this point. He does not partake in the rest of uh, what we're going to see here in verses 26 and following. But they're back to the eating. <clears throat> Jesus took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples. So where are we in the eating? We're at the lamb. Okay, the lamb has now been brought out with the with the bread. <laughs> And Jesus is taking the uh, taking the bread, breaking it, and giving it to the disciples. And he says, take, eat, this is my body. And in Luke's version, it says, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this as a memorial to me. So Jesus here now is completely reinterpreting the Passover, right? The Passover, which the Jews have held for hundreds and hundreds of years, Jesus is now reinterpreting. And he's saying, <clears throat> this part of the Passover, this bread, this is my body. This is my body broken for you. This is my body given for you. The, the unleavened bread used to be a symbol of, uh, of the Jews leaving Egypt. The, the, the unleavened bread now 
is a, a picture of his body, uh, which is sacrifice, which is given uh, for him. We'll keep going and we'll come back to that. <clears throat> Verse 27, then he took the cup <clears throat> and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. Drink from it, all of you. All of you drink from it. Okay, so this is again why I believe Judas is not there. Okay, <clears throat> drink from it, all of you. And then he explains it in verse 28. <clears throat> for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now that's a super powerful verse, right? That's the whole gospel in one verse. My blood shed for you for the remission of sins. This is a new covenant. <clears throat> God always required blood for a covenant. <clears throat> and so this is not a surprise that he points out the blood and he talks about the beginning of a new covenant. Um, in Jeremiah chapter 31, I'll turn there, you don't have to. In, John, in Jeremiah 31, 31, though you may want to write down this verse. <clears throat> Jeremiah 31, 31 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day, that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquities and their sin I will remember no more. So there's no question that when Jesus here talks about a new covenant, this is the blood of the new covenant, everyone in the room's brains would <coughs> jump back to Jeremiah and the new covenant that he talked about. <clears throat> and then the connection with remission of sins or forgiveness of sins that he makes again would bring them back to the the covenant that is uh, talked about in Jeremiah. So again, this is a, a, a you know, my blood which is shed for you. Um, the, the word there it, um, is the present tense, my blood which is currently being shed for you. <clears throat> He's trying to get them to recognize it's about to happen, guys, right? My, my blood is is being shed for you right now. It's about to be shed for you in a moment. And he's, he's again, trying to get them uh, to pay attention to it. For the benefit of many, for the forgiveness of sins. Again, this is the gospel. And remember what he says, drink ye all of it. Drink all of you, all of it. <laughs> all of you drink all of it. All of you bring all of this new covenant into you. Bring all of me into you. Capture the whole thing. I think he's really trying to say to them. All right. <clears throat> Verse 29. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So the question may be asked, how long do we have to do this Lord's Supper? until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom, right? So he puts this memorial in place, and it's a, it's, a, it's a memorial until the second coming, until the Father's kingdom is put in place. So here we have prophecy by Jesus about the second coming, about, <clears throat> about the Father's kingdom. We've got a promise of him coming back. We've got additional hope uh, of, of, him, of him returning, and that there's going to be this feast, there's going to be this uh, time when they get together and they enjoy one another's company again uh, and, and have this, this time uh, uh, in my Father's kingdom. So I think that's a, a nice, joyful end to what he is saying about, uh, you know, uh, this is my blood, this is my body, uh, but and I, I need you to keep this until <clears throat> we get back together again and we can enjoy this feast together. And then verse 30, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And as I said, the, the hymns that they would sing would be these hymns in Psalms uh, 113, etc. 
So let me just, uh, I know we're right about time. So let me just read for you Psalm 113. It's very short, <clears throat> but this is how they would leave the room. Psalm 113, praise the Lord, praise those servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to its going down. The Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who dwells on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth. He raises the poor out of the dust, lifts the needy out of the ash heap, that he may seat him with princes, with princes of his people. He grants the barren woman a home like a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. <coughs> so this is the way they would end the Lord's Supper with these praises to the Lord. <coughs> and here we have now the institution of the Lord's Supper. Now, one thing that's very important for you to get in your head. <clears throat> Jesus here has the last Passover with them. It was his intention that this was the last Passover that should ever be held. He's concluding the Passover and moving from the old covenant to the new covenant, right? The new covenant based on his blood, based on him as the sacrificial lamb. No longer do they need to keep the Passover uh, um, with the old covenant because there's now a new covenant in place. So it's his intent that this is, this is why he's so fervent to have this Passover with them <clears throat> so he can close it out with them and they would understand the close out of the Passover and the beginning of this new memorial, which is the Lord's Supper. Okay? Okay, okay? All right, any other comments or questions on that sequence? It's super cool. I mean, I hope you just find it to be super cool. Uh, what, what Jesus has done here uh, by, by completing the Passover and uh, by instituting the Lord's Supper here. And, and, you know, again, his death is tomorrow, by the way. And we'll get into that as we get into the rest of these passages. Anything else? Just one comment, Rich, on, on the on the timing here. This is cool that this lesson happened on Communion Sunday. I mean, it, it's cut. I'm sorry, say it again. I, I, somebody yeah. cut out. That communion service. <laughs> We're about to go into the service and have communion. Yeah. That, oh. You, you didn't schedule that. <laughs> I didn't schedule that. <laughs> Yeah. That's the way God plays. <laughs> He's the master. All right, anything else? All right, let's move into prayer requests then. Joanne. So uh, we got the, the email from CT. Can somebody uh, pass on that information to the group and for those that might not have seen it? Um, Denise just texted me last night, I don't know, it was 830 or something, that they had just gotten a message <clears throat> that her mom fell and fractured her hip and that they were at Mary Immaculate. So CT and Denise were in black, so they were leaving immediately and driving home. She's supposed to have surgery this morning, so um, I haven't reached back out to them because I was going to wait till after service and see if that's been done. So... So we're struggling to keep them on our list. Uh, hips are bad <laughs> uh, yeah. for people of that age, so we need to remember them. <clears throat> Dave Belford, Mary Belford, right? Denise's mom, Mary Belford, is that? Yeah, is? yeah, all right. All right, Hugh. Um, I think we had the Wolves on uh, online. Oh. They yeah. wanted to. Morning. And uh, Rich, I think the recording might be still going. So uh, we're hanging in there. Stephanie is doing okay. Her breathing and her coughing.